Teresa of Avila, writer, mystic, saint. Some of us here have been closeted in a sort of interior castle, um, by which I mean the old Radcliffe Infirmary, for the last two days, um, exploring through a wide range of speakers different aspects of uh, St. Teresa's work and her legacy in celebration of the 500th anniversary of her birth, which is today. We are delighted and honoured that Rowan Williams uh, has come to speak to us today. The climactic point of this conference uh, on Teresa of Avila as a reader of the Gospels. You want to hear no more from me, and I really don't think Rowan needs a lengthy introduction. So it's time for me to be silent and to invite Rowan to speak. It's a very great pleasure and privilege to be able to speak on this subject to this audience. Though also just a little intimidating, as one or two of us were saying earlier today, we speaking about Teresa to several who know a great deal more about her than the speaker does. I've elected to speak about Teresa as a reader of the Gospels for a number of reasons. First of all, it seems to me central to our understanding of St. Teresa to see her as somebody who wishes to reinstitute in the Church the primitive apostolic pattern of life. The categories she brings to bear in thinking about the monastic life are categories that are shaped not by ideas of contemplative life in general, but by some very specific narratives and sayings, especially from the Gospels. And so my hope is that in these reflections that I'm sharing with you, I'll be able to pick out some of the governing themes of her use of the Gospels, some of her favorite passages and stories, and to think a little bit further about why and how those particular passages matter. There is, of course, an immediate question as to what she knew of the Gospels. She did not, of course, like modern Christians, have access to neat, pocket-sized copies of Holy Scripture. And one of the most interesting and most problematic aspects of her life and her interaction with the church of her day is that, of course, she was living through a period during which access to literature in Spanish, on prayer, on theology, on the Bible, was more and more being restricted. However, even though vernacular translations of gospel readings in church came to be prohibited after a certain point, those gospel readings were still there. Passages read aloud during Mass, passages excerpted during the Divine Office. And like the majority of her contemporaries, Teresa's main access to the Gospels was in the liturgy. She speaks, however, as someone who has at least at some points in her life had access to gospel texts beyond the lectionary alone. And here she is writing in The Way of Perfection, chapter 21. I have always been fond of the words of the gospels that have come from that most sacred mouth in the way they were said, and found more recollection in them than in very cleverly written books. I especially had no desire to read these books if the author was not well approved. If then I draw near to this master of wisdom, he will perhaps teach me some worthwhile thoughts that will please you. 
That little passage, in fact, reflects something of a major upheaval in the 16th century ecclesiastical scene in Spain. In 1559, access to books in the vernacular on prayer of the spiritual life had been severely restricted by the Inquisition. Teresa is writing for her sisters a few years after that to explain to them what you do when there are no books to read. She's careful to say, you notice in that passage, that apart from the Gospels, the only books she really enjoys reading are books that are officially approved. It's part of her strategy throughout the way of perfection to say that she is, of course, perfectly accepting of the Inquisition's decrees in every imaginable respect. And she says this so often and so eloquently that it's surprising the Inquisition's suspicions were not more readily aroused than they were. But it's a telling passage because it's one in which she makes clear one of the main themes of the way of perfection, which is that you can reconstruct Christian doctrine and Christian teaching about prayer from some very, very restricted residue. If you have the Our Father and the Hail Mary, you know what you need to know. You have the books you will require. So she can write again in The Way of Perfection that, just a moment, It seems to me now that I should proceed by setting down some points here about the beginning, the means, and the end of prayer. I shall not take time to dwell on more sublime things. No one will be able to take from you these books, the Our Father and the Hail Mary. And if you are eager to learn, you won't need anything else, provided you are humble. The Inquisitor who read this text has left in the Escorial manuscript a marginal note saying, ominously, it appears she is criticising the decision of the Holy Inquisition. <laughs> Indeed, she was. <coughs> no one will be able to take from you these books. So whatever has been taken away, in terms of the literature that's available, the routine life of the praying, teaching, worshipping church provides the texts that matter. And that's why, in The Way of Perfection, the longest single section deals with the interpretation of the Lord's Prayer. She says towards the end of The Way of Perfection that unfortunately she's left herself no room to explain the Hail Mary as well. But it's an insight which is perhaps behind another telling phrase which she uses in chapter 37 of the way of perfection. As she embarks on her, her reflections on the Lord's Prayer, we ought to give great praise to the Lord for the sublime perfection of this evangelical prayer. This evangelical prayer, this prayer which, so to speak, sums up the Gospel text. So whatever the degree of Teresa's actual access to gospel texts, whatever the extent of her knowledge of texts independently of liturgical reading, and as I say, I suspect there may have been a little more than just liturgy, she works from the assumption that you can in any case rebuild a systematic approach to prayer and teaching from these routine performances in church. That being said, it's time to turn to the actual citations of the Gospels which you find in her work. And I want to look briefly at the spread of those quotations and references, the balance of sources, which Gospels she uses at which points, before moving on to look at the main controlling themes and the favourite narratives that she uses here. I shan't attempt to go in detail through every single citation of the Gospels in all her works. But what I'd like to do is to focus on three works, for the most part, 
that is, her life, her autobiography, the way of perfection, and the interior castle, with uh, some brief references to one or two other works, um, including the soliloquies and the commentary on the Song of Songs. To give you some idea of the balance in the three large works I've mentioned, in her autobiography, St. Matthew is quoted about 15 times, St. Mark three times, St. Luke nine times, St. John six times. In the way of perfection, St. Matthew has 22 references, Mark two, Luke 20, and John 11. In the interior castle, there are 15 citations of Matthew, none of Mark, 16 of Luke, and 25 of John. Now, this doesn't immediately tell you all you need to know, because, of course, there are times where a citation may be Matthew or Luke. There are times when Mark may be cited on the surface, but actually it's a garbled rope reminiscence of another. But it reflects, in fact, the very long-standing liturgical preference in Western Christianity for St. Matthew. Matthew has, on the whole, the largest representation in Western lectionaries. And one reason, of course, why Mark appears so seldom in lectionaries is that practically all of Mark's text is there in Matthew and Luke anyway. The relatively limited reference to John in the life is a little surprising. The extensive reference in the interior castle is not at all surprising. And as we look at the particular texts that she chooses to use and to focus upon, we'll see why those texts are perhaps focused on in those specific settings. One thing which is possible, of course, in the light of this rough analysis, very rough and ready analysis, is to look at where her quotations cluster. Because it's not simply a matter of isolated quotations scattered fairly evenly through a text, but a matter of certain texts which are quoted in, as you might say, in bundles several times over. And one such bundle, not at all surprisingly, is the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew's Sermon on the Mount accounts for nearly half of the quotations in the life, for example, and similarly in the way of perfection. So that blessed are the poor in spirit, or heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away, from the Sermon on the Mount are quoted more than once in those texts. five times in the way of perfection, three times in the interior castle, the Sermon on the Mount is highlighted. Once or twice you will find, come unto me, all who travel under heavy laden, also quoted. So the dominant cluster in Matthew is the Sermon on the Mount. And apart from that, most of the citations are fairly isolated quotes. In the pattern of quotation from St. John's Gospel, there are three what I call dominant clusters from chapters 14, 17, and 20 of John's Gospel. Chapter 14, mostly the texts around, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Those uh, texts from chapter 14 are quoted three times in The Way of Perfection, once in the interior castle, I'm sorry, five times in the interior castle. The quotations from chapter 17 are mostly around a cluster of verses about the indwelling, the mutual indwelling of Father and Son. Jesus in the Father 
we in Jesus, praying in Jesus. And from chapter 17, there are four citations in the interior castle around that area. From chapter 20, perhaps a, a little surprisingly, the single reference, but not infrequent, some four times in the interior castle, as well as elsewhere, is the risen Jesus saying to the apostles, peace be with you. So the Johannine texts of the Gospel that are being referred to are of very cardinal theological significance in understanding the nature of our union with Christ, Christ's union with the Father, the peace that flows from that union, the indwelling, the sense of Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, another verse that's quoted, and they establish a broad theological framework for thinking about Christian prayer. And that's why I say it's not surprising that the interior castle, which has the most broad brush, extensive treatment of growth in the life of prayer, has the largest number of Johannine quotations. Teresa, you might say, in thinking through theologically what's going on in the life of prayer, depends upon a strongly Johannine framework. However, there's another set of questions arising from her use of St. Luke. And it's to St. Luke I now turn, because I believe that her use of Luke is among the most interesting features of her citations from the Gospel. We've seen that in Matthew, the cluster, the favoured cluster of quotations is the Sermon on the Mount. But the favoured clusters in St. Luke are almost all narrative. They're almost all about particular stories, particular encounters, and particular figures. And that narrative focus in her use of St. Luke appears in reference to the presentation of Christ in the temple and the song of Simeon, the Nunc Dimittis, in the story of the sinful woman in the house of Simon the Pharisee, and perhaps most frequently in the story of Mary and Martha. You will also find reference to the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, the publican's, the tax collector's prayer, Lord have mercy upon me, a sinner, and a reference to the prayer of the thief on the cross. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Rather surprisingly, we don't find, I just mentioned this in passing, we don't find in her use of St. John's Gospel any reference to Mary Magdalene's vision of the risen Christ, which you might expect, because, as you will have noticed, the narrative clusters from Luke are heavily dominated by the figure of Mary Magdalene as she was understood in the 16th century. The sinful woman in the house of Simon the Pharisee, Mary of Bethany, these are of course traditionally and habitually understood in the Middle Ages and the Western Catholic tradition as identical with Mary Magdalene. And one of the things which Teresa does very interestingly is by bringing these stories together to provide almost, I'm tempted to say, almost a novelistic picture of Mary Magdalene. There's a strong level of dramatic identification of this figure. And as we shall see in a moment, she sees the story of Mary and Martha in Bethany and the story of the woman who was a sinner in Simon the Pharisee as deeply connected through the figure of Mary in a very particular way. What she has to say about this could be summed up in this way. The woman who is a sinner in the house of Simon the Pharisee, whom Jesus defends against Simon, and who is said to be forgiven because she loved much, and Mary of Bethany, reproached by her sister 
sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening rather than helping with work and is defended by Jesus. These figures come together in the form of a woman who needs defending by Jesus. A woman whose reputation is bad. A woman who is spoken about negatively and who therefore needs to rely on the grace and generosity of Jesus to defend her. The identification is fairly obvious, I think, there. But let's look in a little more detail at what she has to say about Mary and Martha. This is The Way of Perfection, chapter 17. St. Martha was a saint, even though they do not say she was a contemplative. Well now, what more do you want than to be able to resemble this blessed woman who merited so often to have Christ our Lord in her home, to give him food, to serve him, and eat at table with him, even to eat from his plate? Um, that last phrase was later deleted. <coughs> if she had been in ecstasy, like the Magdalene, there wouldn't have been anyone to give dinner to the divine guest. <laughs> well, I think of this congregation, this convent, as the home of St. Martha, and that there must be people for every kind of job. Those who are led in the active life shouldn't, however, complain about those who are absorbed in contemplation. These active ones know that the Lord will defend the contemplatives, even though they are silent, since for the most part contemplation makes you forgetful of yourself and everything else. So let them recall that it's necessary for someone to make the meal. Let them consider themselves lucky to serve with Martha. Let them consider how true humility consists in great readiness to be content with whatever the Lord may want to do with them, and always finding oneself unworthy to be called his servant. So there we have two elements of our understanding of the Martha Mary story. An insistence that the contemplative, while silent and humanly speaking defenseless, you know, there is nothing to be said practically in favour of contemplation, must rely on the Lord to step in and take her part. At the same time, we mustn't suppose that there is any kind of fixed hierarchy between the active and the contemplative because both are necessary and, as she says repeatedly in her works, Martha and Mary work together. And when she writes in the interior castle about the higher reaches of contemplation, she insists that it's not, so to speak, Mary superseding Martha, but Mary and Martha working together so that the active person in the highest states of contemplation is acting more effectively because of her contemplative depth. As she says, you actually are rather better doing the washing up in the highest states of contemplation than otherwise. The state of ecstasy and disturbance is, so to speak, in the middle of the story, when you can only think of one thing at once. But as you advance in spiritual maturity, as contemplation becomes natural to you, then of course you do what's to be done and do it with more concentration and effectiveness. So she's refusing regularly an easy polarization between the contemplative and the active. She's reminding her sisters here that there is dignity in the work of the active life, that the contemplative life, likewise for all its apparent uselessness, is defended by the Lord. So that interest in Mary and Martha together and that sense of the contemplative being able to rely on Christ's defence tells us something about how she's approaching this particular gospel passage as a key image for both the life of the individual praying sister and the life of the community, and how she is, I think it's fair to say, also projecting onto the figure of Mary Magdalene her own sense of being a woman under criticism. But that comes over even more sharply if we turn to some of the discussions of the woman who is a sinner 
the house of Simon the Pharisee, which is twice referred to in the way of perfection, three times in the interior castle. And, uh, excuse my reference to my notes here. Excuse yourselves, they will be lacking someone to defend you. Observe how the Lord answered for the Magdalene, both in the house of the Pharisee and when her sister accused her. He will not be as harsh with you as he was with himself. At the time that one of the thieves defended him, he was on the cross. So his majesty will inspire someone to defend you. When he doesn't, no defense will be necessary. And in the interior castle, she has more to say about how the woman who was a sinner in the house of Simon the Pharisee has been the object of unfavorable comment, gossip, and delation, and how in the first century context, such hostile comment was even more marked than it is now for those who are in some sense at odds with prevailing wisdom. So if you think now that you're having difficulties being criticized for being at the Lord's feet, just think how much worse it was for Mary Magdalene, who was not only wasting her time at the Lord's feet and embarrassing everyone, but also had something of a reputation to live down. So that sense of being a woman needing defense, a woman under attack, is a key for understanding how Teresa sees her own identity as a Christian and the way in which her sisters generally should understand what it is they face, what they must rely on in order to do what they've been called to do. You see there how the figure of Mary Magdalene and the figure of the thief on the cross also elided. These are people who come to Christ without justification, authority, defense in human terms. These are people who have no status on which to trade, and they are accepted without question. Which also helps to make sense of another rather telling little passage in a short um, work of Teresa's discussing the responses of various of her clerical friends to a statement she had heard in ecstasy. It's a, a well-known little piece of rather satirical writing, the Vecham, in which she discusses what her clerical associates have said about this little phrase and makes gentle fun, not so gentle fun, of all of them including St. John of the Cross. She writes of John of the Cross's response that it is full of all sorts of things that Father John of the Cross usually talks about, darkness and struggle and dark nights and so forth, and that's all very well, she says, and it's probably fine for people who are doing the spiritual exercises with the Jesuits. But if you look at the Gospels, you find that there's no requirement that the Magdalene or the Samaritan woman, when they come to Jesus, first have to undergo a massive process of spiritual detachment and maturation. <laughs> they just turn up. <laughs> and that is, I think, an interesting sidelight on the way in which she's talking about Magdalene in the passages I've mentioned. Because fundamental to her reading of the Gospels is quite evidently the sense that the Gospels tell you about the Jesus who is accessible to all comers. And 
those who present themselves without authorization or qualification to Jesus are accepted for who they are and, criticized for that, duly defended. Another passage that she touches on rather briefly in passing is the story of the woman with the flow of blood who touches the hem of Christ's garment. And she makes a rather similar point about that. Teresa's sense of her vulnerability as a woman seeking to teach in her context is very much in evidence in the context and the background of these readings of the Gospel. She lives in an age where many women like her from wealthy and moderately educated backgrounds endured a fair amount of what the sociologists call status inconsistency and cognitive dissonance. That is, the power which they know they have as a matter of fact in society is a power which is not recognised by the authorities in that society, ecclesiastical and social. This is part of her way of coping with that. She knows that she has authority as a teacher in her communities. She knows she has something she wants to say to her sisters, and she knows too that she comes from a social background and associates with a social environment in which women have a good deal of liberty and authority. At the same time, she is being told by the church to which she belongs, and by many of the voices in the wider society, that as a woman she does not have the right to speak in this way or to act in this way. Hence the complicated, and as I've sometimes said, slightly flirtatious rhetoric of much of her work. I know I am a weak and ignorant woman, but... Hence also the celebrated little outbreak in the early chapters of the Way of Perfection, when having detailed the ways in which women are undoubtedly spiritually inferior to men, she says, all the same, I know who stayed around at the crucifixion. <laughs> Again, the Gospels are being read in a certain way to make some sense of her own conviction of authority and justification in her witness within the church and society, for which she believes she will receive a defence from His Majesty. It's all of a piece with her general complex approach to issues of honour and status in church and society. In a church which was increasingly, in her lifetime, obsessed, as was the wider Spanish society, with issues of purity of blood, <coughs> pure racial ancestry, old Christian family origins, she is consistently and eloquently derisive of any reliance on family status, on ancestry. She will have known, surely, something of the Jewish background of her family, and while it's never spoken of in any of her works, and was indeed not spoken of at all until the middle of the 20th century in the scholarly literature, it's a factor which makes a great deal of sense of her feeling, as I said earlier, of being a person in need of defence. She is vulnerable as a woman who is a teacher, vulnerable as somebody of mixed blood, somebody with a Jewish father. So when she picks up these Lucan stories of Jesus' accessibility to the defenceless, the unusual, the disturbing, Jesus' openness to those who come without justification, without qualification. She is writing very clearly about her own sense of vocation for herself and for her sisters. And that also ties in, I believe quite interestingly, with what she has to say about contemplation itself. It's almost as if she is suggesting that the very life of the contemplative is a risky, defenseless, unreasonable vocation in the church, to be defended only by Jesus, not by any attempt to justify 
in the terms that might satisfy the unsympathetic observer. By associating her own contemplative vocation with the status of the not very respectable and marginal figure in the Gospel story, she manages intriguingly to merge the categories of the contemplative and the marginal in a way which is, I believe, very distinctive to her rhetoric and her theology. So, as a reader of the Gospels, Teresa seems to have two main focal points and streams of interest. The one is the simpler one, in a sense, which I've touched on in connection with her use of St. John's Gospel. Very understandably, she uses the great texts of John's Gospel, especially from the farewell discourses and the high priestly prayer, chapters 14 and 17 of St. John's Gospel. She uses those texts to make clear and unambiguous points about the role of the incarnate Christ in the life of contemplation, which is, of course, another of her major themes. You never get beyond the incarnate Christ. She uses it to make the point that only through Christ is there a way to the Father. She uses it to think through the mutual indwelling of Father and Son and contemplation as an entry into the prayer of the Son, the life of the Son in the soul. That, as I say, is, in a way, the simpler theological perspective. It's when she turns to the Lucan narratives that you begin to see how the social constraints under which she's living the climate of the church, which she knows, begin to shape her reading and her interpretation. She turns to the stories of particularly Mary Magdalene coming to Christ defenseless, in need of Christ's affirmation, needing to rely on Christ to defend her and to rely on nothing else. And subtly, and intriguingly, as I say, she connects that with the very nature of the contemplative vocation, it seems. That vocation which will always be under attack for its relative uselessness. She very, again very intriguingly, and rather carefully, refuses to turn that simply into an affirmation of the superiority of contemplation over action. To display the uselessness of contemplation as a mark of status over against the merely practical would be to undercut ex exactly what she wishes not to say about Christian life and Christian community. To say that if you're a contemplative, you therefore have honour and status greater than your sister, that would be to unravel what she has to say about Christian community itself. So she is ingenious, <coughs> balanced, and rather unusual in what she has to say about the Martha Mary interaction and indeed fusion. She's reading the Gospels for theological perspective and reading them also as, in some sense, a source of legitimation for both the contemplative life itself and for her own role, and to a lesser extent the role of her sisters, as women called to take authority in a certain limited but very real sense within the community, within the church's witness. At the very beginning of the way of perfection, of course, she's already explained why the vocation of her convents is so important in a world in flames, as she describes it, Christendom dissolving around her. In such a critical situation, where north of the Alps there are all kinds of monstrous heretics, it's more important than ever that there should be those who live this kind of life, this kind of evangelical, gospel, apostolic life. People who, in effect, not only use the Lord's Prayer and the Hail Mary as texts for theological understanding, but who are willing themselves to become texts to become embodiments of the stories of Mary Magdalene and others. <laughs>
So, moving towards a conclusion of sorts. We might say that part of what Teresa is interested in, doubtless connected at some level with her own hidden racial identity, part of what Teresa is interested in is the Christ who is receptive to the other, the stranger, the one without the obvious claim. Remember what I said earlier about status inconsistency. You know that you are more than your society tells you you are, but there are no obvious ways in theory, theology, philosophy, ideology of making that clear. And so you turn simply to the affirmation of the divine. And the notion that the contemplative in the church stands for and stands with the difficult and challenging and claimless other is one well worth meditating on in our own time. This is, of course, not only the 500th anniversary of Teresa's birth, it's the 100th anniversary of Thomas Merton's birth. And there are passages in Merton's journals, especially in the early 1960s, where the notion that the contemplative stands in for the unacceptable other in American society of the early 1960s is a very, very prominent theme. There are various ways in which we can bring Teresa and Thomas Merton into conversation. I suspect that may be one of them, although I don't intend to develop it here. I would invite you to reflect on it and perhaps develop it further. There are many other gospel interpretations in Teresa's works which I've not had time to explore further. It's worth noting in passing that she quotes John chapter 4 um, three times in the way of perfection, once in the interior castle, the encounter with the Samaritan woman. And although there are one or two places where she mentions the Samaritan woman in the same breath, so to speak, as Mary Magdalene, this is generally in order to quote what Jesus says there about living water. So it's a little less pertinent to um, the main point here. There are other passages to which she refers. I mentioned that she does more than once quote the Song of Simeon, mostly in order within that story to refer to Simeon's prophecy that a sword shall go through the heart of the Virgin Mary, and the sword in the heart is part of what the contemplative may expect. And of course, she will refer a couple of times to the egalitarian nature of the original apostolic band, which is devoid of honour and status, so that St. Bartholomew, who, as you all know, was the son of a king, everybody knew that in the Middle Ages, but we appear to have forgotten it, Bartholomew and St. Peter, who was a fisherman, are on exactly the same level. So, in the back, in the deep background, there is the apostolic model, the fact that she, again, more than once, talks about the ideal size of the community being about 13. She clearly wants to recreate the apostolic life in a very literal way. As I've just said, that is part of the deep background to the way in which she deals with these specific texts. So, I believe that Teresa's reading of the Gospels is one informed both theologically and pragmatically, a reading which certainly seeks for the large themes, the comprehensive structures in which to think through the life of discipleship and the contemplative life in particular. But then comes that extra edge in which the contemplative life itself is seen as existing at the same kind of angle to the expectations and conventions of church and society as Mary Magdalene comes in at an angle to the stories of the New Testament needing to be defended, comes in as somebody without claim, comes in therefore as exactly the sort of person who is welcomed by the Christ 
in whom Teresa believes, the Christ who does not require that before we come into his presence, we have ascended Mount Carmel. We do have a little time for some questions. Uh, it's quarter to six. So please, please, any observations? Yes. Loud and clear. I'm interested in your methodology. Um, how, how did you think of looking at the various references in the Gospels? as a way of looking at the thought patterns that St. Teresa is using. I'm always very wary when people ask me about my methodology. <laughs> but, uh, because working on Teresa years ago, I became more and more conscious of how the status issues in her work are all over the place in the way of perfection, and how um, her, the particular people she's interested in in the Gospel seem to be often these, like the public and the thief on the cross, and Magdalene. So I, I decided I would simply look at what the gospel quotations were, how frequently she refers to these figures. Hence what I say about um, the narrative clusters from St. Luke's gospel in particular, which seemed to emerge very clearly when I looked. But it, it grew out of simply the sense that these are the themes that, especially in the way of perfection, and in some of the foundations and some of her short soliloquies come, come up regularly. Yes, where's it back? I think we have an implement so that uh, the questions can be heard. 